China has released its economic growth numbers for 2023 at 5.2%. Now, the Paul Krugmans of the world, the Western mainstream media doing what, uh, or at least playing at uh, what seems to be economic analysis, has claimed that China's economy is on the verge of collapse, that there are indicator after indicator, mainly in the property sector, real estate sector, that show that China is on the decline while the United States has released its numbers uh, well after China's uh, at 3.1% growth. And the enthusiasm for this has been just wall to wall in the pages of the New York Times, Washington Post, etc. Now, China and the United States are uh, at significant odds. The U.S. has been employing many measures to try to decouple and contain China's rising economy. Could you talk about this decoupling myth and the reality of the situation? Is the West, uh, in particular the United States, correct it, through its periodicals and mainstream media that China is on the collapse? And if not, well, what exactly is going on and how does it relate to this emerging multipolar world, the rise of BRICS, etc.? Okay, there's a lot of noise around all of this, as you rightly point out. And so it requires a little bit of um, opening the space so that we can talk without being lopsided cheerleaders for one or the other. So let me begin with China. China is an enormous economic experiment. It should be understood in that light. It should not be held up to standards that don't apply to an enormous historical experiment. Let me explain. A half a century ago, China was, by all counts, among the poorest most backward countries on this planet and had been in that position, a position that Xi Jinping refers to often as a period of humiliation for two or three centuries, during which large and small colonial powers could simply arrive at a port city along the Pacific coast of China, uh, send in a few cannons, a few troops, and establish an enclave, a portion of a, of a city which would be for them and their nationals to set up shop and to exploit whatever opportunities for trade uh, might exist. Um, over the last half century, this country, now numbering roughly 1.4 billion people, you know, that is over four times the population of the United States, much larger than Europe, and so on and on. Over this relatively short historic time, half a century, more or less, they went from the worst poverty imaginable. For those of you who have never read a Western work on China at that time, the work of a missionary family, um, the author Pearl Buck, B-U-C-K, uh, The Good Earth, I believe is the title of her novel. She wrote more than one would give you an insight. Uh, you won't forget it. The images are incredible in that book. So here you are half a century later, and it is the admir admirable object of almost disbelief, or in the case of Paul Krugman, straight out disbelief. Nobody has believed it. They didn't believe it in the 1950s and 60s when there was talk of communes, 
and of incredible rates of growth. They didn't believe it later on when the government shifted. They didn't quite believe it when Russia and China came to loggerheads that included military conflict between them. They didn't believe it more recently when economic growth rates were listed every year between six and nine percent and sometimes even more when the usual relationship between GDP growth in China and that in the United States was a relationship of three to one, three times faster in China than in the United States. More recently, when they said they had lifted somewhere between six and eight hundred million people out of global poverty into middle income level, people didn't believe that either. People didn't believe any of it. The most typical reaction of intellectuals from the West going to China and coming back was a statement that began, you can't really believe it, but... And then they would describe modern cities that they had visited, modern institutions, and because we're going to end up there, the peculiar quality of China that instead of allowing slums to develop, they build the housing ahead of the people's ability to afford to buy it, meaning that there are blocks of empty, completed or nearly completed apartments. As if this were some sign of massive uh, resource investment that had gone astray, rather than a strategy, which by the way, may be the wrong strategy, but it's a strategy coming out of a country which, strategically speaking, is not the first one you would want to throw stones of criticism at. But it is a huge country. It has serious raw material and food issues. It has a history of an expatriate community elsewhere around the world of Chinese citizens with complicated relationships back home. It is trying things of all kinds, some of which don't work because that's what experiments are all about. So yeah, they have problems, they have imbalances. Their record in the field of civil liberties is not what you want. There's all kinds of social criticisms that can be made, and by the way, are made in and by Chinese people about what's going on there. So this is in no way, what I'm about to say, no way some kind of celebration of China as if they don't have serious political, economic, and cultural problems. They do but they're quite different from those in the United States. And the way to begin to understand the difference is to go back to look at it, the big picture. The United States is an empire going down. China is an empire going up. And the ride up is way better than the ride down as Americans are discovering, and as the British have an entire century of having had to live through. And if you study Britain at all, you will know just how painful it all has been economically, politically, culturally, financially, you name it. So let's look at the comparison. So we start with where you began, and that's perfectly legitimate. The United States is ecstatic that the 3.2% growth rate of the last quarter 
compares to the 5.2% growth rate in China. Now, on the one hand, that's reasonable because the gap between China and the United States is now smaller than it's been for most of the last 20, 30 years, where it was, to remind you, three to one, six percent, two percent, eight percent, two and a half to three percent, and so on. So, yeah, there's less of a gap. The Chinese economy is still growing. It's still growing faster than the United States, and it's a bigger country to begin with. So you're talking about vast creation of wealth. Let me give you an idea of that, just again, statistically, so it's in everyone's head. You can add up the GDP, gross domestic product. That's simply a crude, very crude, rough measure of the total output of goods and services in a country in a calendar year. So it gives you a rough idea how big the country is relative to some other country. And at the beginning of this program, we talked about purchasing power parity and other measurement details. But let's be real clear. The GDP of China together with its allies, and I'm here going to count only the original BRICS allies, Russia, China, India, South Africa, and Brazil, those countries. There are now six more that more recently, a few months ago, joined the BRICS. I could add those. It'll just make what I'm about to tell you even more extreme. In the year 2020, they passed like ships in the night. What am I referring to? Well, the United States and its allies, the G7. United States, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, Canada, and Japan. The year 2020, the total GDP in the world of the G7 and of the BRICS was about the same about $30 trillion. Here we are roughly three years later. The share of total output of the G7 has dropped from 30 to 29%. And of the BRICS, before I add the latest six countries, 33%. It's over. It's finished. The lines are unmistakable. And 5.2 relative to 3.2 only makes the gap bigger. Why is this important? Again, the reasons are many. I'm going to give you a few in the hopes they stay in your mind. Every country in Asia, Africa, and Latin America And let me lean across my screen here and say to you, every country without exception is having private, intense conversations in the presidential palace, in the halls of the Congress or the parliament of of each country. If we need in this country a huge loan to build up our cities, to finally have a proper education system, to finally construct a national health insurance system, to build a railroad, to bring in high technology, to da, to da, to da, whatever. It used to be that the place we go to get an investment, to borrow money, to secure a market, to do whatever we have to do to move forward in becoming less of a poor country, in becoming more industrialized. We would have to go to London or New York or Paris or Berlin, or you get the picture. They don't have to do that anymore. They have 
an option. They could go to London, Paris, and Washington. They probably will. They probably do. But you can be damn sure that they have also organized a trip to Beijing or to New Delhi or to Sao Paulo. They're going to play one against the other. They're going to see where they get the bigger deal, the better deal. And they're prepared to give as good as they get. They will make deals and provide China or Russia or India what they need in exchange for the help. And they're going to discover, as they already have, that the wealth of the BRICS being now larger than that of the G7, you're going to get sooner or later a better deal. And you may not be ideologically you know, aligned with the BRICS. Often they aren't. But they know where the bread is to be buttered. They weren't so thrilled about being aligned with Washington or London either, but they knew where the bread was buttered. And when people reproached them, they said, well, you know, where are we going to go to get the help? Everything has changed. Nothing is what it was. And staying in the old mindset is leading to terrible miscalculation, as we discussed in Ukraine. But in case any of you are wondering, the exact parallel miscalculation lies at the base of what is going on in Gaza or in Yemen or in Syria or in Iraq and Iran. Yeah, the United States can bomb or throw a missile. It cannot undo what I have been describing. That's why the votes are lopsided in the United Nations around Ukraine. That's why they're lopsided around Israel and uh, the Palestinians. It's just, it's not what it was. You cannot function the way you did. Britain by now is a minor, irrelevant adjunct to what the United States is doing. You could see it. The United States decides to bomb Yemen. England says, gee, can we send along an airplane and drop something too? Sure. Why not? What difference does it make? Answer, none at all. The irrelevance of the English stands as a stark, I was about to say monument. Monuments come after. What Britain is, is something that comes before. Britain is telling the French, the Germans, the Italians, the Spanish. You're going to become Greater Britain. You're going to become adjuncts to the United States because your only alternative will be to join the BRICS. And that's too big a shock to your system so far for you to even contemplate it. I should qualify this. For those of you who keep track, Mr. Macron did inquire about joining the BRICS, but they turned him down. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. 
For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much and I look forward to the next video.